Hello, this is Mike again from Scratch. Welcome back to our ongoing closer look at Game Engine series. Uh, today, the Game Engine we are looking at is one that I had actually never heard of until uh, just a couple weeks ago, and it's called Otter 2D, as you can see on the screen in front of you. Uh, it's a 2D, very quite simple uh, game engine built over top of the SFML uh, C++ media library. So there's uh, quite a bit of content here on YouTube and on Game From Scratch covering SFML. I'm actually doing a tutorial series as we speak. Uh, it's a library I enjoy, um, but it's it's more of a framework for providing functionality for a game engine. It's not actually a game engine itself. And that's where Otto, uh, uh, duh, Otto kicks in. Uh, it's a layer built on top of SFML, or specifically the SFML.NET bindings, uh, but it provides more of a complete game engine. So there's uh, there's entity classes, there's component classes, there's animation, etc. An entity there was a keyword. So this is sort of like an entity component system light. There's components, there's entities. Uh, it's not as diehard as some of them are, but it does take a nice modular approach to data composition. Um, so that's Otter. We're gonna, again, we're looking at that today. Uh, it doesn't really have any tooling per se. So this is gonna be much more uh, code heavy or tutorial heavy than a lot of these closer look at's are. Uh, we're just gonna jump in and basically look at how to program various aspects using Otter. In some ways you can think of this as a getting started tutorial, almost a complete tutorial. because so we're gonna cover uh, in basic level pretty much everything you would need to know to make a simple 2D game using Otter. Um, to get started, you're best off to just download uh, this zip file right here. Uh, it contains a project file, etc. Uh, Otter doesn't build as a set of DLLs. You actually include it in your project, which I'll show you now. Um, so I'm gonna be creating this in Visual Studio 2015. Let me just go ahead and turn presentation mode on so you can see what I'm doing. I guess it's already on, okay. Um, so first things first, we need to go ahead and create our project. I'm just gonna create a console app project I'll call it Otter YouTube. Actually, I'll call it, sorry, my bad. So put it in temp, call it Otter YouTube, like so. Now I've already downloaded that zip file and extracted it to a folder called Auto in uh, Otter in my temp folder. So click this, go ahead, creates our project, and there we go. So now what we need to do is go ahead and add that other project. So add existing project, and as I said, it's here already, so you would download and extract that zip file somewhere. Uh, but temp, otter, and then this CS project right here. Yes, I trust it. Okay, so there you can see otter has been added to your project like so. So now the last thing you need to do is add a reference. Uh, where the heck did that go? There you do it here. Project solution, otter. So we now refer to that other project, we're good to go. So this allows you to actually make changes to the underlying code if you wish. If you'll look at the directories here, Otter's pretty straightforward in how it's set up. Each of the classes is, it's, it's well-defined, clean enough code. So if you want to extend it or change what they've done, it's easy enough. Uh, but now we've got our project. Let's look at creating a very simple application, pretty much the simplest application you can create in Otter. And that is, so first off, we're not actually gonna need any of these using, oops. Yeah. All right. What we need to do is using Otter like that. And in main, we want to go ahead. Let me zoom this a little bit. Uh, coincidentally, there, like all the other um, closer look at game engine series posts, there's a text version of this on GameFromScratch.com. So don't worry if you if you're not keeping up with the code I'm writing or you want to refer it. All of the source code is available on GameFromScratch.com. So don't worry too much if you're not keeping up. Uh, but the heart of an Otter app is the game, like so. Very simple. Uh, we can give it a title here if we want it. Uh, set the dire directory, etc. I'm just going with all the defaults to start with. So create a new game. Uh, I'm going to set the background clear color to white. It just makes it a little bit easier to uh, see what's going on at times. And now that you've got your, your game, you basically need a scene. A scene is your scene graph. It's where all the entities that make up your game uh, reside. Uh, so you can think of a scene as a level or as an entire game itself, but it's where things that have a position are stored. Um, so scene equals new scene, like so. And now finally, as I was mentioning, the scene contains all your world entities. And now we need an entity. An entity is simply something that's positioned somewhere in the scene. Uh, we'll call this one entity one equals new, oops, entity. 
So, and we should probably get our entity to actually do something. And here's where part of the component nature comes in. So entity one, and then we're gonna add entity entity one, and then we're gonna um, add a graphic component to this guy. So add graphic, and what we're adding is an image create circle. So we're basically creating a circle image procedurally on the fly that we're gonna pass in as a graphic. Uh, we'll give it a 90 radius and let's make it red. So, and then finally, oops, let's see back here. We want to add our entity to the scene. And now it's time to go. Game dot start start running with the scene we just created like so a little clean up all right perfect that's it that is your very first ever otter application we'll just go ahead and run that and boom there you go now one thing you might notice there is right when i started it the um, otter window unfortunately does not get focus i spent a little bit of time trying to fix this i tried p invoking to the set focus method from the win32 api i tried a couple other things and i just can't it seems to be an underlying bug in the sfml libraries it, it may have been fixed i'm not entirely certain uh, but it is an annoyance but when you get past the debugging point where you don't have this console run window running in the background anymore it shouldn't be a big deal you just won't create a console window you'll create it as a, a full windowed application but uh, that was it. That was your very first ever Otter application. And as you can see, the code is simple. It's clean. The uh, design is, is fairly consistent. And we're just going to kind of build on top of that all as we go. Now, very commonly, instead of doing what we've done here, what we'd also do is just um, create your own entities. This is how you would logically probably define your game, break your game up into instead of one large main file. So in that case, let's go ahead and create an entity instead. We'll call the entity player. Here's from the entity class, like so. And all our uh, entity really is going to do is go ahead and do the exact same thing we just did, actually. Uh, so player and the constructor will take floating point x and y values, like so. Let's pass that back through to the base constructor. And open, and close. And this dot add graphic, it's an image, create. Circle 90 radius red. All right, so basically you've got the exact same thing we just did otherwise in code, but instead of doing it now this way, get rid of that, and we make our entity a player instead. Run that. Oops, what did I call you? Player. Player. All right, it's upset about something. What did I do wrong? Oh, now, sorry, we, we gave it a different uh, profile, so now we actually have to define that. Either that or we have to create a default constructor that doesn't take these values, uh, but we'll just pass them in. So this is your location of your player, and in we go. Now there's an important thing to be aware of here too. You notice I passed in 0, 0 for the coordinates and it's being drawn here. Uh, by default, I don't have a mouse cursor on to show, but uh, by default, the origin is the top left corner of the window and the, uh, the origin or pivot point of your entities is the top left corner of the graphic. We're gonna look shortly at how to change this. It's very simple. Actually, I'll go ahead and do it now. I'll break away from how uh, I follow in the text version of this just slightly. Uh, and all we need to, actually no, I'll, I'll go back to that later on. So I'll stay consistent to the text version. Uh, so just be aware, we can change the origin, no problems at all. Uh, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and look at um, loading a sprite instead of a procedure regenerate graphic like this. I'm just gonna keep writing and changing over top of um, this example. So I'm basically, I'm just gonna keep adding new things. Like in this case, player image into an entity. So, so we're just gonna create a new entity and then down here each time, I'll just keep changing the type like so. And so this guy is gonna go ahead and use a graphic um, for its source and uh, let me just open that guy up. This is where I got the graphic from. There's a package that was announced. I have this link on Game From Scratch. So if you need it, go to Game From Scratch. I'll link Game From Scratch below and I link to this source. But this guy basically released a set of sprites uh, for creating uh, top-down of World War II airplanes. And that's what I'm gonna use for this example. 
Uh, specifically, uh, just grab everything I'm going to be using. This is from an earlier test. But this graphic right here. So it's a top-down shot of a B-17 bomber, and we're going to use it for our sprite examples. I've actually got three frames of animation, and there's not much of a difference between them. This is one, two, and three, and I merged them all together to create a sprite sheet right here that we're going to use it a little bit later of a date. So I'm just going to grab that. We're going to also be using these audio files later on, so I'm going to just grab everything I possibly need here. Uh, I might show you tiles later on, I'm not sure. So there's an OGG um, music file, there's two waves, uh, three sprites, and a sprite sheet that we're going to use. So I'm just going to copy all those. I'm being very lazy. I'm just sending them into the, the bin folder of our directory, sort of the debug folder. So obviously when uh, you build for release, you're going to have to move these somewhere else, or you'd set your working directory up to actually include assets somewhere else. But for my case, it's easy enough just to toss them in debug. So the big thing that we needed here is this 1.png. Obviously, substitute whatever image you want, and you can use all of the ones I'm using in this example, all of the sound files, everything. They're all linked on Game From Scratch, uh, or use whatever you want. Um, ultimately here, the image formats supported are the same ones that SFML supported. Uh, so that means off the top of my head, I'm going to miss a couple here, uh, BMP, PNG, uh, TGA, uh, HDR, uh, GIF, and JPEG, and PIC uh, are all image supported image formats. Now, uh, each one supports a varying level of transparency support and they're all of different sizes so like a BMP file has no transparency support whereas a PNG offers transparency and it's quite a bit smaller um, so which format you actually use is completely up to you but now that we have that file right there added now let's change up our code slightly so that we have player image doing something dun, dun, dun. So at the same time, we're also going to add uh, the ability to control our sprite in this example. Uh, so inside of our constructor, which I do not have yet, so player image int, oh sorry, it's flow. Flow x, flow y, flow y, flow y, I think, yeah. Call the base. All right. So in our constructor, we want to just load that graphic. So this dot add graphic. And instead of uh, image.create, we're actually going to just create a new image. Ew, what did I do with my keyboard? New image, and then pass in the file name. Like so. And really, that's it. Uh, so now we have an image instead of uh, that circle that we were procedurally generating. Now we're going to actually go ahead and implement some logic on this so that you can actually respond. And that means we're going to do an override here. We're going to override the method update. Now update is called every frame, oops, the uh, auto completion of Visual Studio got ahead of me. So this is going to be called every frame. This is where you would obviously update the logic of your um, your entity. Uh, and what we are just going to do is do a check. So input dot uh, key down. So as you can see, polling for input is very, very simple. And then we check which key we want. So if the right key is pressed, and, and similar to down, there's um, input dot key. So there's released uh, and up. So your logic can obviously depend based on which one you want. So if the right key is pressed, we're just going to move right. And if input dot key down, key dot left. And really, that's it. So now we've got a controllable entity that instead draws a graphic. So, okay, I already changed it over here. Now let's go ahead and run that. Ta-da! So here we are up top left. Uh, and now if I click here to give focus, I can use the arrow keys and we can now move our sprite about. So quite simple. Uh, again, that's going to be a consistent word I'm going to use a lot today. Uh, so that's uh, adding a sprite to the mix here. Let me just get rid of this guy, make some more room. So now we've got an image that's procedurally generated, an image that is uh, drawn from a sprite. Now let me just go ahead and what am I moving on to next? Oh, animation, I think. Uh, yep, sprite animation. So earlier on when we grabbed ss.ping, 
you see that we have the three images all in the same file. Now we're going to use this. It's either you can call it a uh, sprite sheet, a texture atlas, uh, or as it's called in uh, Otter terminology, it's a sprite map. Uh, now we're just going to go ahead and add one of those for our uh, controller. Back to my code. So, so we'll add yet another class. And this one is class. Uh, what did I call the player sprite map? Like so, it's an entity, like so, and public player sprite map constructor float x float flowy. Okay, apparently I do that every time, and call back to base. No trouble. All right, done. Now this is going to require a small amount more work, but but not a ton. Don't worry. Uh, we are, however, going to need. Any new. And this is massively overkill right here, but this is pretty much the IDs within your map. Now, a map as a data structure basically is a key uh, value pair set. So, the, the map uh, part of the mapping is you map a key to a value. And the key in this case is going to be this enum. So, enum animations, and it's massively overkill because we have one animation called idle, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But this is basically the prop spinning. So we're not we're not doing anything else. We're literally just standing still. And now our sprite map also needs uh, a member variable here of type sprite map. And the type you pass in is your key. So it's keyed to animations. That'll make sense in a sec, don't worry. And it's a sprite, what did I call it? Capital, yeah, capital equals new. And you pass in the file with the sprites, and then the size in pixels of each sprite. So that image was uh, 768 by 256, which was three 256 images all smushed together. Uh, so, like so, that is our sprite map that we were going to use as our uh, graphic source. And now in our constructor, we go this dot add. Oops, a bit of a spoiler there. Add graphic, and it's our sprite map, like so. Uh, so instead of using an image, we use the sprite map as our graphic source. And now here's how you go ahead and change the origin. So instead of referring to something by the top left corner, I'm going to refer to it instead by the middle. And that is just done by uh, taking our sprite map object uh, and center origin, like so. So that basically says refer to it from its middle position as opposed to its top left. And I'll show you this in action, then we'll move it a little bit as a result. Uh, so we're centering it. Now we have to go ahead and add an animation to our sprite map. So sprite map dot add, and we use our animations enum. So we're adding our idle animation, animations dot idle. So we do so, and next up we tell it uh, an int array of, of offsets for positions within the sprite sheet. So we want the first, second, and third uh, tile or sprite within the sheet. It's going from top left over and then down, over, down, over is the order that it processes these. And then finally, you can pass in a float array of uh, frame times. I did this in the other example here. I won't keep my uh, my code entirely on screen, but you can you can pass in how long each frame of animation lasts. And then finally, now that we've defined it, play. Oh, animations I don't. So you tell it which animations. So if you had, say, another three frames of animation in there, so what you could have done is something along the lines of And then this would be, you know, frames three, four, and percent, uh, five, and on and on and on. In this case, we only have a single animation. We'll keep it simple, but that's kind of how this setup works right there. Uh, so that's about it. Now I'm gonna also we're gonna keep the controls in, but this time I'm gonna actually show you how to do it frame independent. Uh, so regardless of the speed that a computer is running at, it will uh, run smoothly and at the same speed on all machines. And that's again, we're gonna handle our update. Uh, pretty much same logic. Input dot is key. Oh, wait a minute. Key down, not 
is key down. Key down, key dot right. So exact same thing, just instead of just plus plusing uh, x naively, we're instead going to move by uh, 300 pixels per second of total animation. This is this dot game. So game again is the heartbeat of all of it, uh, and every entity has a reference to it. The, the game that it's contained in. So this is a handy way to access it. Uh, and then real delta time. And this is the amount of time that has elapsed in milliseconds since the last call to update. And we divide that by a thousand to make it usable math. Uh, why do I have a, I don't have a parenthesis. Okay. Uh, let's do the same logic for left key. but your minus instead, like so. And update is fine, done. All right, so let's go ahead and run this. You're gonna notice a couple things. First one didn't happen at all. Oh, my bad. You're gonna notice absolutely nothing because I didn't change. They're literally running the same code as last time. All right, so there's the first thing you'll notice. Since we're center, we are now off screen. Like so, that's the effect. So the pivot point of our graphic is now its midpoint, not its top left. So now we're a little bit off screen. We're just gonna go ahead and actually position this guy in a different location as a result. And this can be done by game dot half of width and game dot half height. So this will return basically the midpoint of our screen. And now let's run it again. And you shall see there is our sprite, and if you look closely, you can notice the propellers are in fact moving. So we have a three frame animation running over and over and over again, and now if we press the arrow keys, we move at a constant rate of 300 pixels per second in each direction. So uh, definitely some progress there. Uh, again, adding sprite animations, etc., to this mix certainly wasn't difficult. We're, we're not hard yet at all. Uh, now the next thing your game's probably gonna need is collisions. In collisions, we're going to actually just reuse our yeah, copy paste reuse. We're going to base it on this class right here. We're going to add collision functionality to it. I'm also going to change the constructor slightly so that we can make this a player or an enemy um, passed in. So what did I call the sprite map with collisions like so? So we'll add one more value here as bool player or is player. I suppose we need to actually keep the method is player. Oops. We'll just leave it like that. It's part of the constructor, so it will be set. So is player equals player. All right. And then all that we really use that for is you can only control keyboards if it's a player. All right. So my logic is. We just do keyboard updates if it's a player object, otherwise it's a stationary object. That way we can just, we don't have to create an enemy and a player. I do need, however, to update the constructor name like so. So now we wanna go ahead and check for collisions. In order to do this, we need two methods here. First off, we need another uh, map identifier like what we used earlier for animation, but this one's gonna instead be for all of the different types of collision entities in our scene. Uh, we'll call it collider types and really all we have in our scene is one entity type so uh, planes uh, but that will be useful in a moment uh, we also need no we don't uh, we just need to now after we define our spark our animation like we had earlier with the uh, graphic object that part of the entity there's also something called a collider so this dot add collider like so, we're going to use a box collider because our shape is basically box-like. Oh, actually, you got to give us some values. Uh, so our image sources are 256 by 256, and really that is what we're going to go ahead and use here. And we pass in our collider type, collide and spell, and it's a plane. And you'll see where that's useful in a second. Uh, so that adds a collision um, aspect to our entity. So our entity can now collide with stuff. But now we actually need to collide with stuff. And we're going to do that in the update. So after we handle our input, but before we call down to the base update, uh, and we're only going to do this actually in the is player. So we're not going to check for collisions 
in uh, NPCs or non-player entities. But let's check for a collision. If this dot collider dot overlap uh, you know, the position of this, so it's X and Y location, and collider types planes. So basically what we're asking is, do we collide with any types of planes? Now you could also see how the collider types can be used here. You could create a collider for uh, bullets, uh, background, etc., And you could do the, the test separately or all together like we have here. In the event that a collision occurs, we're just gonna go this.x equals zero. So we're just gonna move it back to where it started from. So now we have these two entities, or we actually we have one entity, but we're going to have two. Let me just change it. So there is entity one. Now we need entity two. So this is what we're gonna collide with. And this one is a player. This one is not a player. And add the second entity to the scene, like so, and run. And let's actually change this up slightly. Uh, let's move the player to the left side of the screen and this guy to the right side minus half of its width, like so. Okay, so there we go. We got our player sprite is the one on the left-hand side that's slightly off the screen, and our NPC sprite is the one on the right-hand side, and now I'm gonna hit the right arrow, and boom, we're hitting. Now, one thing you're noticing here, however, is that um, our collision isn't particularly precise. And this boils down, this is actually because of the images we're using. Let me show you quickly. Um, So, so why are you so slow? Ah, there it comes. So you see right here, I'm gonna do a quick line. So right he and here. It says dead space right here in the sprite. And then you gotta figure it's multiplied by two. That is why it appears that they're colliding when they're not actually colliding. Now you can fix this obviously by having your sprite take up the entire sprite sheet. Uh, or you can use something called a pixel collider. Uh, pixel collider is actually going to do the collision using the pixels of each image as opposed to um, the uh, the box, the bounding box we provided. Or I guess you could have also passed in a slightly smaller value here, uh, which immediately, like I say, if I want to change it, nah, you suck. If I change this down by say 10 pixels, that box would have shrunk and the collision would be a little bit more accurate. Ooh, actually that reminds me, I actually forgot to, all right, seriously, stop running. There. Um, I should have also called this dot collider dot center origin. So we want to have the same orientation as our parent sprite. So if you do this, you should also, when you're done with the collider, do this. Uh, but it didn't apply in this case, not a big deal. Uh, but that is collisions, quite simple, but you could change this out quite easily to be, um, like I said, a pixel collider instead of a box collider, and it will use a pixel by pixel, and it'll be very, very precise, but it'll also be very, very slow. So one else seems to be aware of. Uh, but a pixel collider right here is an option. It takes slightly different parameters. I'm not gonna go down that road right now, but just be aware that is an option, and it is a lot slower. Um, so really, that's, that's graphics. We've already covered, um, uh, sprites, procedural, uh, sprite maps, and collisions here. And that's kind of the basics of what you need to make most simple 2D games. There's really not a lot more to it. So now we're gonna move on to sound. And sound is, again, just, just about as easy. Um, we're gonna go ahead now and create one more player. And when it comes to this code, we're not gonna need, we don't need our second entity anymore. So we don't need to add it anymore, like so. And we're gonna create one more player. And this player is actually capable of playing sounds. Uh, we will use the image class instead though. So class player image with sound. It's an entity of course, like so. And so we're gonna need these two sounds. There's a, if you read the source code comments, you'll see where I got them. I download them from um, freesounds. Or freesound.org. Uh, one is like a machine gun, a 50 cal machine gun firing, or 30 cal machine gun firing. The second one is like a cartoonish bomb sound. So sound one equals 
new sound. Uh, once again, it depends on SSML for its sound functionality. So it supports the formats that SSML supports. It's, it's, there's a ton of them, so I'm not going to go into what they all are. Uh, but if you need to know what for, file formats are handled, you need to look at the SSML music documentation. Like so. Sorry about those constant bings. The computer beside me is being annoying. Okay. So we've got our two sounds. That's pretty much all we need. So let's create our constructor player intro sound. Okay. And in our constructor, we're going to go ahead and uh, actually, we're just creating a graphic. Nothing really special there. Add graphic. Uh, new image one uh, PNG. Like so, all right, one sec. I'm gonna get rid of that ping. All right, sorry. Hopefully, it's gone now. Oh, Mr. Parenthesis. All right, so add your graphic and uh, let's stay consistent. We'll center that graphic too. Let's start graphic center origin. So, you see, you can also access the component via the graphic. Um, Whereas we did it earlier by uh, manipulating the uh, sprite map directly. So that's the second way you can access it. All right, so now we're just gonna do it on keyboard handling. And in each case, we're gonna play the sound we want. So public override update. All right. If input.key down key. One and play our sound. Munch that one. All right. So you've got a lot more options than I'm showing right here. You can also play a sound. You can loop them, etc. You should probably close your if statement off correctly. I'll show you that in a second. And let's get. If you press number key two, and back here two. So this is direct playing of sound, but you can also have gone sound two dot. So we can look at it. There's a lot of things you can set. Um, duration, the current duration, attunation, uh, offset how far into play. Uh, you can change the pitch. Uh, you can have positional audio and then set coordinates. And it will actually calculate where the sound is coming from and modify it accordingly. Uh, but in this case, we're simply just going to play said sound like so. That's really, that's it. Actually, let's go ahead and play. So there's our sprite being drawn. It's animated, so obviously I've done this wrong. Uh, let's change this over to player's image with sound, and we will make you add a half width and a half height. All right. So now, if I press one, That is um, each time you press a sound. If you so, if you want to have multiple gunshots concurrently, create multiple instances of that sound and play it accordingly. But really, that's it. That is all that was involved in playing sound. Very, very simple. Uh, now we're going to go ahead and look at the same thing with music. Uh, but instead of extending an entity here, we're going to actually create an extended scene instead. Now, uh, the difference between music and sound is pretty minimal. Um, the big thing here is it's it's normally an, like an MP3 file or an OG, OG form based file, a little bit bigger, a bit longer in duration. And we are going to now, let me just grab my code. Yeah, there it is. Create a new scene. So class scene with music. And this is how easy it is to create scenes. Uh, and it is a scene. Like so, and we're going to need some music. Again, this is a song I downloaded from freesound.org. And again, the link is on Game From Scratch. So it's called music.org and false. The second value is, do you wish to loop it? And we're gonna play with it a little bit, so we're not gonna loop it. Instead, we're going to do some other stuff. 
Uh, so now I need my constructor. Scene with music. And all the constructor is going to do is start our music playing. Ta-da. So that's all that's involved in playing a song. Completely done. Now let's add a little bit of logic. So we're going to interact with our song that's playing. Um, override, update. All right. So once again, we're going to handle the keys. I'll also show you mouse handling in this. Uh, it's, it's just like uh, handling the keyboard, though. So don't, don't expect much new. So if input.mouse button pressed. So if you press one of the mouse buttons, and we're going to go with mouse button dot left, like so. And then what we're going to do is, if you press left, we're going to decrease the music's volume. So music dot global volume minus equal 0.1f. That's a value from 0 to 1. Um, so if we started at 100% volume on your computer, that is the equivalence of a 10% decrease. Uh, right and this will be a plus. So there, your mouse is now controlling your volume. Uh, so left and right increases accordingly. And then now what I'm gonna do is also input if key, uh, well, input dot key down. So if you press the space bar, we're gonna fast forward by 10 seconds in our song. So I'm gonna show you how you can track inside of a song. Um, unfortunately, there's no event, so you can't wire up your music to say like on done play and fire something up. You kind of have to track it yourself, but it's not hard at all, uh, as we're seeing here. So if offset, so this is the current position into the song. Uh, let's see, what was I doing? If oh, I missed a race. So if the current location plus ten seconds or ten thousand milliseconds is less than song duration. So if 10 seconds from now, the song is still uh, valid, we're gonna go ahead and jump forward 10 seconds. Like so. All right, so that is on Spacebar where we are going to track forward our amusement playing. And finally, here I'll show you what happens when you end playing the song. So you can check that by song dot is playing. So if it stops playing, and then we're just gonna exit our game if it does. Okay, so uh, the left and right mouse button are increasing volume, spacebar is fast forwarding 10 seconds, and when we hit the end of the song, we exit our game. And let's go ahead and see an example here. I'll move my headphones closer so you can hear just in case there's anything going on. Oh, geez, I did it again. I really have to stop doing that. Let's try this again. Um, so now we created a scene uh, as opposed to, so I need to actually update my scene. So scene music, and well, that's all that you've got to change. So now that we've created a, our custom scene as opposed to default, there is my incredible choice of music playing in the background. And I press space bar. It's about a 60 second sample, so I'm gonna press space bar. Oh, get focus. Space bar, jump forward 10 seconds. 10 more seconds, 10 more seconds, and 10 more seconds, and then done. End of the end of the sound, and we're gone. Uh, so really, that's it. That that's playing music. Um, you don't have the ability to, you know, out of the box say, uh, play this, then undone, play that. But the logic here uh, could just been when the song is done playing, pick a new random song and and run with it. So the code wise, dealing with music is ultra, ultra, ultra simple. Uh, so really, that's it. We covered sound, we covered collision, we covered music. And there's only really one other thing to cover, and that is components. Um, components are kind of cool. Uh, like I said, this is sort of a component-based engine. We've seen a couple with like the graphics and the collider and stuff, where you can create custom components, which are basically collections of code that you tag to your entity. And we're going to show you one last type of entity, and this one is controlled by a component. We're also going to create our own component. Let's start with creating our own component, actually. And it's very, very simple. So we're gonna create custom component, and it is of type component. And the component has a reference to the entity that it controls. And all you really do in a component is implement its update method. So this is called again on a per frame basis. And what we'll do with this one is sd.get graphic. So like I said, you, get, you have access to the um, uh, 
base entity. This one's going to get the image component, if there is one, or blow up if there isn't. So we want to get the alpha value of the uh, graphic attached to this. And alpha minus equals 0.005f. So we're basically making it slightly less opaque each frame. And if alpha is less than or equal zero, alpha equals 1.0f. And finally, entity.get graphic image alpha equals alpha. 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 I can't, can't type balls. And that's it. That is created. We just created a custom component which takes its entity that it's attached to and makes it invisible over time until it becomes invisible, in which case we make it visible again. So now let's look at consuming some of these. We'll also look at a couple of the built-in or out-of-the-box components available. So class player with components. Again, it's just an entity. Ooh, hey, what did you do? Oh, just went down the line. Okay. And public player with components. Float, fix, float, flowy. I do that every single time it appears. So now, I suppose we got this dot add graphic new image one dot png. So, like so. so now we're going to actually go ahead and create again, as I said, a couple of the out of the box components available. The first one is something called an axis, which is for um, mapping directional control. So we're going to create so axis, and we're going to use one out of the box. There's axis dot create, and there's arrow keys and WASD. So this basically maps input from the WASD keys, the WASD keys, to left, right, up, down axes. And that's really all that was involved in creating that. Next, we're going to use the basic movement controller, uh, which we're going to use to tie our axis controls to the input of our entity. And again, very, very simple. Movement, there's new basic movement. And the values it takes are uh, basically acceleration rates. So this is the maximum speed around X and Y, and then the rate of acceleration. And now that we have our movement, we're gonna tie its axis to our axis controller, which controlled by the WASD key. So we just created two components, one for axis mapping, the other one that is the movement link between our entity and our axis controller. And now we're gonna add those components to our entity. So this is a very easily reusable code. As you can see, you can slot it into anything that needs to have movement or and the movement can be controlled by a different component in a different way. Very clean, very simple design. So add component. We're gonna add multiple at the same time. So components instead of component. And you just pass in each of the components you're adding. So we're adding axis, movement, and we're gonna add one of our components. Like so. And finally, this dot graphic dot center origin. Done. Okay, and I'm not gonna make the mistake this time. And let's go back to a normal scene so we don't have music playing. And run. And here you'll see it is now fading. And that is our custom component running and handling that alpha value transparency. Now if I click and give focus, the WASD keys move us around. So it's that easy to add uh, functionality to an entity. Uh, you can do it, as I said, in a reasonable manner by defining your own components or using some of the ones that are defined out of the box. Uh, there are several built into uh, the engine, so it is a cool, clean way to code. And it kind of brings us to the end. Now there's one last thing I'm going to mention very, very briefly because frankly, it doesn't work. Uh, there's support for tiled level editing out of the box and the, the file format is is it, uh, yeah, Ogmo Editor. And this thing ugh, stinks, I hate it, it drove me nuts. This editor is the default editor that they use out of the box. And you can come in here and you can sort of basically create tile maps, tile sheets, drag and drop, and then save the files and load them into your uh, Otter project, no problem. Now the problem with this guy is every single time you make any changes here, you're going to edit prop 
project. Um, and this is important stuff. This is where you add new layers, link up tile sets, add entities, etc. Every single time you change this, it erases everything and you have to start over. It's unusable. It's crap. And even worse is when you take those exported tile maps and load them into um, Otter, which you can do in two or three lines of code, they don't work. They don't look right. So unfortunately, Ogmo is a piece of crap and it is the one thing that is built in out of the box. So hopefully, um, and if you go to the forum, you'll see, like, th there is a forum, we'll see that in a second, and you'll see that a lot of the posts are actually about Ogmo, and please get rid of Ogmo, and listen, Otter2D developer, if you're listening, I know a developer could hook up Tiled or uh, another map editor fairly easily, but out of the box, if you provide that functionality and get rid of this Ogmo crap, your, your engine will look much better to people. That Ogmo integration is by far, in a way, the worst part of Otter in dealing with it that I encountered. So I uh, just want to bring that one up very, very briefly because really I only found two areas, two flaws, and one is really minor. One is that lack of focus on the window it creates, and again, very, very minor. And the other thing is this Ogmo integration. It just didn't work, and the experience of working in Ogmo, I'd rather smash my head off the wall. So please, if you're listening author, add tiled support, or just remove Ogmo support, and the world will be a better place. All right, so basically that's it for coding. Uh, that's a good introduction of what uh, Otter brings to you, brings to the table. It's it's a cool engine. It's very clean. It's very simple. It's very uh, user friendly. It's definitely one of those engines that um, I would recommend to someone just starting out. Um, it's very solid, easy to learn, very, again, consistent in how it works, which is, again, a nice thing for people trying to intuit how to use the engine. So. On that level, I highly recommend it. Now, here's the thing. It's built over SSML. It's very um, uh, much niche. There's not a huge community built around it. Um, the documentation, etc. here, let's bring that up for a second, uh, is here. Now, you, you potentially you could support iOS and Android, but for the most part, think of this as a desktop only engine unless you're willing to go through some pain because it's built over SFML, SFML, which only just got iOS and Android support and it's somewhat experimental. So I don't know if that carries down to the SFML.net bindings that Otter depends on, but even if it does, that will now mean you have a dependency on Xamarin in order to port to either of those platforms too. So if you're looking for a mobile engine as it stands right now, this probably isn't your right choice. But if you're looking for pure 2D, especially as a learning engine on the desktop, this is a great choice. It's, it's actually a very clean, um, quite complete in functionality engine. Um, so you come in here, here is the Otter. The community is here on the forums. It's not the most active place in the world. There's only a handful of forums. You can see 150 posts, 50 posts, 25 posts, 79 posts, 301. This is a fairly um, niche, unknown, unheard of engine. So the community obviously is going to be quite small. On the bright side, the author does seem quite responsive in, in um, answering questions. So it's not an unsupported engine by any definition of work, but there's not a huge community around it, at least not yet. Um, now the other part is you've got, in order to get started, um, in all honesty, most of what we covered here would probably get you started. Uh, we covered probably 85 to 90 percent of what you would need to create a 2D game. So uh, we nailed a bunch of it, but there is a set of examples that cover, you know, uh, collision tile maps, text graphics, uh, hateful Ogmo level editing, uh, shader support, more a bit on components, etc. So there is decent tutorial material on everything that's uh, required. And on top, if we come back here. There is the documentation link, which is a system-generated documentation for um, all of the classes, etc., that make up Otter, uh, as you can see right here. Now, one thing I found very, very confusing is um, there's no logical ordering, um, and it's it's incredibly obvious if you come here to classes and you look here, I'll go class list. There, like the box collider. Uh, then line and then alarm and then so whoever is responsible for generating this documentation please for the love of God make it sort alphabetically it becomes a much easier place to handle but on the bright side there is decent commenting in here the reference material is pretty much all that you should need the, the reference material combined with the um, 
um, the examples should get you up and going. And again, you're linking to the library directly with full source and such. So you can jump in and change things and modify things and work with things as much as you feel comfortable for doing. So this is providing that missing game engine functionality that SSML does not have. And it's doing it in a language which is frankly a lot more beginner friendly and in my opinion better, but I'm not going down that road, than C++ is. So it does make this very accessible to beginners or people that just uh, want to code. And, and that's the cool thing here. This is an engine you can learn in an afternoon and get some pretty nice results in, especially if you would like to work on um, at the code level as opposed to focusing on um, you know, tools and engine, like at the, the higher level stuff. Uh, you'll learn this about a thousand times faster than you'll learn 2D games in Unreal or Unity, for example. But of course, you're looking at much different flats of things. You're, you're, if you're wanting to make a commercial game for iOS or Android, probably not your choice. Uh, if you're looking to port to, to a different platform, probably not your choice. But if you're making a PC game, for sure, there is a lot here. And it is possible to support and to port your game to those platforms later on. It could just be a bit of a pain in the ass to do so. Um, but really, that's it. That's, that's Otter, uh, Otter 2D. Um, it's a cool little engine. If, if you like C Sharp and um, you're looking at creating a 2D game, I recommend you check it out. It's, it's quite cool. Just do yourself a favor and stay the hell away from Ogmo. Hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much.